How are you guys doing? Welcome over here to the channel. If you guys are new, do yourself a favor and hit that subscribe button at some point throughout this video if you do enjoy it. You don't want to miss out what's going on. Tomorrow is a big day inside of Russia. A lot of stuff is going to be happening inside of Moscow, so you want, you're going to want to stay tuned for that. I'm telling you guys right now, it's going to be it's going to be big. I don't know exactly what they're going to do, but anyway, I want to tell you guys right now, if you guys are new, the mapping you guys are seeing here in my hands is going to be red, it's going to be Russia, blue is going to be Ukraine, black is going to be like logistical routes and so on and so forth. This is the map that I make every single day. It is updated and annotated for you guys every single video. So yesterday I was speaking about the Wagner group. Now, with that being said, I, I compared them to the French Foreign Legion. That is my apologies. I should have compared them to more like Blackwater, not the French Foreign Legion because they are connected to France. Okay. Now that is my apologies. I know a lot of you guys and gals in the comments were a little bit offended over that. So I do apologize. I'm going to retake that statement, take it on back. And I'm going to say right now, I'm going to compare them more or less to Blackwater and not the French Foreign Legion because they're not really the same thing. So just wanted to get that out of the air. Just clear the air there. So we all know that Russia is actually prepping for their victory day tomorrow. But apparently they they actually been prepping Putin's military at a very young age, which I want to share this video with you guys right now. Now, I do believe there was another leader back in the day who also had their own version of a youth. So we're just going to leave it at that so you guys can, your imagination can just spin there just a little bit. So a senior military expert on Russian state TV said the Russian military wouldn't accomplish a whole lot, in which I actually do agree with this guy, uh, when it comes to mobilization. And I'm going to explain to you a little bit more after this clip. Раздался грох от больших и малых барабьян, барабанов, затрубили фанфары, объявлена мобилизация. Вот когда мы получим, например, первый истребительный авиационный полк по мобилизации? К Новому году будет. Вот, я про то. У нас нет ни резерва, ни пилотов, ни летного состава, ни самолетов. Поэтому мобилизация в этом плане мало что дает. Но если мы сегодня ночью прикажем строить новые корабли, когда мы получим первый? Через два года. Вот так обстоит дело с мобилизацией. Поставим задачу сформировать, например, танковую дивизию. Когда она будет готова? Ну, я скажу, М-90 это как минимум. И то она не будет оснащена современным вооружением, потому что в его запасах просто нет вот современного вооружения и военной техники. А посылать людей, оснащенных оружием вчерашнего дня, на войну 21 века, сражаться с оружием НАТО, которое соответствует сейчас всем, так сказать, мировым трем, ну, наверное, тоже будет не совсем правильно. Конечно, восполнять потери надо. И в личном составе, и в вооружении, и военной технике. Но все-таки делать это лучше за счет предприятий промышленности, которые производят современную и перспективную технику. Мобилизация в ее классическом понимании этих вопросов не решит. So one of the biggest reasons is the fact the equipment that they have inside of storage is Soviet-era equipment that clearly cannot keep up with what is being brought in and given to Ukraine from NATO. We all can agree on this. An RPG is not the same as an in-law, so on and so forth. It's just not the same. Now, mobilization might be a short-term fix to a long-term problem, which will be the fact that the civilians will have to make up for more, more or less the lack of imports that's actually been impacted by sanctions for them to actually make military products solely instead of making them for export. You get what I'm saying? So they will actually have to essentially socialize their, 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 their civilization to just literally make products for the military. Now, anyway, mobilizing men will actually not be a fix in the next six months or so because all the men that they're going to be called up to join the fight will have to be trained. Now, with that being said, the skilled officers and NCOs that they have on the front lines that have actual experience will be needed to train these men. Now, the problem with that is they've sustained such heavy losses so far into this conflict that they do not have the resources to do so as of right now. So in the end, they wouldn't be able to actually overcome the issues related to manpower, training, and it would actually take some time to produce the amount of quality weapons needed for the Russian military to succeed inside of Ukraine. I hope that makes a little bit of sense. I didn't go on long-winded there. Now, here's another clip I'd like to share with you guys. This is coming out of Russian State TV. We have a few of them today. Anyway, where one of their exports is apparently agreeing with one of my thought processes that the Russian economy isn't fit to meet the needs of its armed forces. Нынешняя система экономической рыночной системы непригодна для решения задач 
обеспечению действий вооруженных сил и вообще страны в этих условиях. Необходимо переходить на рельсы некой другой системы, которую я условно называю система военного социализма, но ее можно изменить как другое, любое другое именование. Так или иначе, речь идет о том, что все, без исключения, стратегические ресурсы, как земля, предприятия, все остальное, должны находиться под государственным контролем и развиваться в соответствии с централизованным планом. Но без этого не обеспечить. Вы анализировали вот хотя бы даже объемы огневых задач, которые решает сейчас наша артиллерия. 1500-600 огневых задач. Каждая огневая задача – это минимум 40-50 снарядов. Умножим. 50 тысяч снарядов получается в день, на всякий случай. Их надо произвести. Ракетные залпы. Да, их надо производить. В день расходуется от 5-6 там, до 10-15 ракет. Так, их надо производить. Мы столько произведем сейчас в день, 5-6. Поэтому уже даже сейчас, вот в этих условиях, при этом конфликте, нам нужно экстренно, экстренно переводить промышленность, нашу промышленность, ну, как на военные знаю. рельсы. All right, so the Russian military has actually moved additional SAM and MLRSs to one of the northern bases inside of Crimea. These satellite images you guys are seeing right now are from the 27th of April. Okay, and also the 6th of May. I have no idea what they're trying to do with this. I would assume they're trying to push and prep for a, another push towards Kirsten. We know that they've lost some ground there, and they want to they get by Mikolai and then push on to Odessa. I mean, that's kind of a big deal for them. But this next clip is also kind of funny, honestly. It's coming on Russia State TV once again. They are desperately trying to keep up so much with the amount of weapons that are being brought into Ukraine that they are now crowdfunding purchases of drones for their own troops. Yes, you heard me say that correctly. They are crowdfunding the purchases for drones for their own troops. And, and the best part about it is they can't, they can't even get them in. They're having, they say they're having to actually smuggle them through Lviv because they can't get them in through their own customs because of sanctions. The irony. Sanctions are working. When the front line of the front say, give Малые, когда люди бешеные деньги скидывают, а когда купили все, что есть в магазинах. Что это чушь собачью? Проблема в России производится? Это значит, то, что поднялся тему, которую все стесняются говорить. О том, что волонтеры, как наши общие знакомые, те же Карнауку, покупают все это, везут туда. Да мы все это покупаем. Это позорище. А это говорит о том, что страна должна перейти на рельсы военного времени. Хватит дурака валять. Пробуй завести что-нибудь, даже гуманитарную помощь на территорию Донбасса. Легче завозить через украинскую таможню, через Львов. Она а, пропускает любое оружие. А, поэтому, а нашим туда ввести что-то вообще невозможно. А поэтому... При этом сто раз говорить. And the head of Russian space agency and former deputy prime minister said today that in the event of a nuclear catastrophe, a nuclear war, was the fact that NATO would actually be destroyed by Russia in less than a half an hour. He goes on to stress that this type of event cannot be allowed because the consequences would impact the entire Earth. Yes, we all get that. That, that's, that's something you shouldn't have to say. I have no idea why somebody inside of Russian's uh, government is always having to talk about the, the effects of nuclear consequences. Like, we get it. Like, you're the only one that's saying you're going to strike somebody with nukes. Like, literally, you guys put it out on your, your TV broadcast that you could take out Britain, America, uh, literally all of Europe in, in, like, what, 17 seconds? So, I mean, no one, no one in America is like, you know what, we're going to take out Moscow. And we don't ever say that. Anyway, he's also claimed that Russian rockets are the most reliable ones on planet Earth and suggested the people who plan the sanctions were suffering from Alzheimer's. I could agree with him in a certain sense that maybe Joe Biden might be a little slower upstairs, but I don't believe that he has that disease as of right yet. It might be oncoming. I have no idea. Nor do I really care to be completely honest with you guys. So we're going to move on to uh, our mapping. So the mapping we got going on here, as you guys can see. So this is my map, as you guys saw earlier over here. As, uh, there's been a lot going on inside of Kharkiv. We've seen a lot of advancements by the Ukrainian forces in these areas uh, specifically. There has been a little bit of movement down here, just south of Chuyiv as well. This is the first time we've actually seen them moving a bit down here. Now, a few bridges have been blown. Let me go ahead and clear this up. Up north of Ruski Tiski, which somebody, I think, actually sent me an email that you don't say Ruski. It's just Tiski, which... I don't, I don't really understand the Ukrainian language at all. I don't know why you'd put a word in there that you wouldn't say. But anyway, uh, through here, there's been two bridges that have actually been blown by the Russians that have been retreating back towards Lifsky, which is right here. I do know this is a thing that has happened. I have not personally geolocated them, so I'm not going to tell you guys exactly where they are. But there has been two bridges on this route, on this main route going north that has been destroyed by the Russians. So just outside of Chuyahiv, though, this is kind of a big deal because the first time we've actually seen an offensive, an assaulting element actually 
move. They've liberated a couple towns from a Russian control. These two areas just right here have been liberated. As a matter of fact, I have, a, I have another map I'm going to share with you guys. This was yesterday's map. So this is the area that was controlled by the Russians, as you guys can see right there. All right, I'm going to move over to this one so you guys can see it. So this is the one we're talking about now. That is now liberated by the uh, Ukrainian forces from the Russian control. Now, this is the first time we've seen any type of Ukrainian force attempting to make a push towards Izium from the north. These are some of the main supply routes that have been coming in. You guys see these big dark ones right here? Yes, those are supply routes. Those are the ones that are taking to move logistical supplies in and out of this area. So Izium is down here in the south. There has been its advancements. One of the major advancements has been right here uh, by the Ukrainian forces over the last 24 hours, and they haven't really pushed any farther than that, but that's that was still a huge chunk. It took them about three days, by the way, to take that chunk back. But if you guys look, this main route that's coming in is probably going to be the area they're trying to get to if they're wanting to get down there. I have a, an entirely no idea what they're trying to do. But this area, I will say, will probably have an assaulting element that moves forward and then also out of this area that's going to pinch. I told you guys they are very, 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 very good when it comes to setting up ambushes, and I think that's going to be one of the things they do on these main routes. So we're going to move over to the eastern side of the country here in a second. But beforehand, I'm going to tell you guys, there hasn't been much movement in the northern part of Kharkiv other than the fact that there's heavy fighting just north right here and also right here, just north of Prudyanka. And north of, I guess you would actually put this north of Durachi. So north of Durachi. All right. So we're going to move a little bit east. There's been a lot going on inside of this area. A lot of advancements by the Russian forces trying to push through. Now, Ukrainian troops have actually retreated from Papazna to a pre-arranged fortified location. So I guess Papazna has been completely destroyed. And the Ukrainian forces moved out of this area because they do not think it's even worth holding as of right now. I have video confirmation. I'd like to share of this with you guys right now. Now, I have annotated it on the map, as you guys can see right here. So I don't know the exact location because this just happened. I don't know whether Ukrainian forces are currently set up. It could be roughly something like this. I don't know, so I have not annotated it. But tomorrow I should have a better idea, and it will be roughly put on the map for you guys. But it also appears the Chessians have made their way into Papazna as well. And I have a video I want to share with you guys of that. <laughs> So just north, I guess just north of Papazna, and uh, it's going to be east of Slovinask, but in the side of this area in the town of Sevirsk. So this area right here, it's not the exact uh, location. Which, matter of fact, I do have the grid coordinate, which I'll share with you guys here in a second. But the Russian forces actually lost three floating bridge vehicles, a tugboat, an amphibious transport, an engineered vehicle, and two BMPs. Those are the images you guys saw just overlaid. Now, I'm going to tell you guys right now, they might be moving into this area to actually push around to get on this main route. Do you guys see this main route that's coming down? I believe that's what they were trying to do, but they got kind of caught up. Which, you know what? I have the exact location. Has been geolocated to right here. This is the exact location those images are coming from, okay? Now, if you look exactly where that is at, it's not directly inside the town of Sevirsk, so there's that. Now, I think this is a this is kind of a big deal. They got caught off guard, and if you guys could tell, here's Sevirsk right there. So you have a Russian element that is right here that is trying to push a little bit more south. So I think they were trying to set up a route to where they can connect to this main route that pushes all the way down and all the way west. I believe that's what they were trying to do, but they got caught off guard by the Ukrainian military and they destroyed all of it. So that is a fairly large blow when it comes to the Russian engineering battalions. Them sustaining this kind of loss could not happen inside this area, and that's going to set them back just a tad bit. So we're going to shift just a little bit west, and I'm going to tell you guys right now, there's been two BTGs worth of men moved down from Izium from the 35th CAA. They're just now just north of Barving Cove, so they've been moved down right now. So they've been supporting this element that is actually trying to assault down to Barving Cove, which that means they are 
clearly not making the advancement they thought they would be, or they're having to replenish the men that they've lost inside of this area. But two BTGs worth of men is going to be roughly, depending on who you talk to, is going to be roughly 350 to 1,000 men. I think we're going to go with the rough five to 600, so you're looking at about 1,000 men have moved down into this area to help them try to assault and take Barvin Cove. Now down in Mariupol. If you guys don't know what Mari Pool is at, we're going to go ahead and back all the way down and slide south. Here is Mari Pool right here. This is one of the last held areas. This very small sliver of an area you guys see right there. There's been roughly 25,000 people that have died in Mari Pool so far, with most of them being civilians. The Ukrainians down in Mari Pool state that they've killed roughly 2,500 Russians while wounding an additional 5,000. Now, that's without support of aircraft or artillery. These numbers are also coming from a Ukrainian source, so I, I don't want to say take them with a grain of salt, but... It is what it is. I, I'm just giving you guys what I got. Anyway, if this is true, that would mean that Russians have actually lost roughly 15% of the initial troops that invaded uh, just inside of Mariupol alone. With that being said, the Ukrainians also said that they've destroyed 60 tanks and disabled another 30, which would be 10% of Russians' losses across the entire country, just down inside of Mariupol. The Ukrainians that are left inside of Mariupol said that they will not surrender and it is not an option. So they're literally going to fight to the death inside of Mariupol. So once again, I've saying this for the last month or so. This is their Alamo. And to me, this is kind of nuts. I've been saying this. I don't know if it's going to go on another week or another week or another week. But I think it's very imperative that these men down there continue to fight because they're having to keep all these Russian forces inside of this area and not be able to redistribute them out throughout the country. So here's some drone footage. If you guys are wondering what it actually looks like down there in Mariupol and what it currently looks like of the last holdout inside of Ukraine. Here it is. Okay, and the last but not least, down here in Kyrgyzstan, there's been another uh, assaulting element by the Russian forces who has actually came back and taken more ground near Oleg Stranjavika, just right here. It is now contested. This area is now contested by both parties. There's not controlled by any one side. I think we've actually seen the Ukrainians lose this three times, and the Russians take it back now three times. So it's been just back and forth the last couple of weeks. So down in Crimea, we know that they're, they're staging those men. And I'm telling you guys, They've been trying to make a push to Krivi Ra, so I know they're, they are putting a ton of Russian forces up here in the northern part, but I do believe they're going to be shifting all those all those MLRSs we saw over here to Kyrgyzstan. I think that's where they're going to go to try to help them push down and take Mykolaiv and then push on through to Odessa. So with that being said, tomorrow's a big day there in Russia. I hope you guys did enjoy this video. We'll stay tuned. We'll see what happens, and uh, that's pretty much it. I'll see you guys tomorrow.